everybody. Good. I don't know. We might have some mornings here. So good morning, good afternoon, good evening for those of you joining us. Um, my name is Seth Collins. I'm the director I'm of learning. Dot do. Um, I just want to get a check from my team. Are we good for audio and everything like that to get started? Not okay, cool. We're good. All right. Um, so I'm going to share my screen and start my presentation so that y'all can follow along. So I already introduced myself, so y'all know who I am already. I'm Director of Learning at Terra.do. And what we're going to talk about today is we titled this presentation, Climate Careers, Will This Job Have Impact? And where is this coming from? So we run learning programs for people. We've taken over 3,500 people through our learning programs in some way, shape, or form. That includes um, our skills training programs, trainings for organizations, and also our the Terra.do Learning for Action program. And especially in our Terra.do Learning for Action program, which is our kind of three-week career accelerator for people who want to reorient their kind of careers and lives towards taking climate action, we often get this question that's, where, how do I get how do I get a job to have the where do, where can I have the most impact? And I used to be an instructor in the course, and this is always a fun question to get, um, mainly because the answer is actually quite nuanced, um, and we're going to go into that a little bit. However, <clears throat> we've gotten this question so many times that we decided to take a step back, think it through, do some analysis on our end, look at all the jobs that we see coming through on our on our jobs board and the other climate jobs boards out there. And, and give y'all um, a framework to think through, uh, how, can I, how can I figure out whether or not a job has impact or not? Um, and how can I find a place that where I, I can have the most impact for myself? So I'm gonna talk you through just sort of what our, um, our thoughts are on that and how, we can, uh, how you can navigate these questions as you are in whatever stage you are in of a kind of climate career um, evolution. So I, I introduced Tara a little bit before, but just in the small chance that you haven't come across Tara before, and this is your first time interacting with us, um, uh, we have a mission of getting 100 million people working on climate change solutions by 2030. We do this through supporting people to learn, um, to find employment uh, and, and other types of work as well, not just employment. Um, and connect, and because we've really we've really discovered that you know community is really what helps people both. Um, accelerate their climate work, find the work that's right for them, uh, and, and be supported as they do it, because it requires a degree of emotional resilience to do it as well. And what do I mean by that? Well, you know, I also wanted to, of course, ground us as to, you know, why are we all here? Why do we care about this? Um, this is just my most recent graph that concerns me about where we're at right now. Uh, you can see many, many of these out there, but this one, um, I always think of the oceans, you know, you can see this picture of the earth where you see no land. You can get like a whole slice of the earth and, and not see any land. And, and just there's so much in our oceans and in the water that, that we really just don't know about. Um, I, I've been become friends with a, a Maori uh, indigenous man who's telling me about how all of our climate science models are wrong because they understand they don't incorporate indigenous knowledge in them and they know the the ocean currents even better than any of our climate scientists so with with that qualification though you know i'm looking at this this graph of daily sea surface temperature and seeing how far you know this was last done in february i i need to update this um but just how far off in in this this year we are um, from previous records and kind of from the norm in the, in the temperatures. And this has impacts on tipping points, um, animal populations in the ocean and, and all of that. And so, I, uh, yeah, why, why are we talking about this? Because there's, there's a lot of work for all of us to do to come together and help get our planet on track to be a sustainable, habitable, and a thriving place for, for all of us to, to coexist on. Um, and there's a lot that we've done as humans to sort of Get this, get us in this position, and there's a lot that we can do to to support it, it going, getting in a different direction. So, you want to get involved in that? What job should you take? Well, I just grabbed this is from a, a couple of weeks ago. I went on the Terra Do job board, grabbed a group of jobs um, that rain, all have different degrees of impact on on our environment and. 
you know, and the world of climate jobs is just incredibly broad. And I, this is just a way to just take a quick snapshot of that. I think this doesn't even do that justice, but, you know, there's a solar asset manager job for a renewable energy company based in Texas. Um, there's a job around manufacturing and supplier quality for a farming organization that produces that, you know, that owns farms and also distributes, you know, oat milk and other plant-based beverages. Um, there's a consultant for the built environment and construction, how to decarbonize construction. Uh, there's an internship role in Paris. These are just like the top six. I just looked at the top six really quickly. Um, there's a recipe developer for a an organization called the Purple Carrot that's trying to help people um, decarbonize their diets and eat plant-based food and understand how plant-based meals can be incredibly delicious and nutritious. And so they were looking for a senior recipe developer. Um, there's an organization called the Cadmus Group that delivers on that supports policy development, and they're looking for a sustainability and resilience research analyst. Um, an organization in in San Francisco um, called Recology that is a uh, that is trying to get you know organizations to get to zero waste, right? So the, the circular economy element of this. Um, how do you compare these jobs against each other? Now, of course, you know most of you probably aren't going to be um, uh, a great candidate for every one of these roles. I know I, I wouldn't be. Um, I don't really have the, I'm not the asset manager, chef extraordinaire, supply chain extra, you know, person who also understands these things. So, but, you know, the, the idea of this is to say there's this whole breadth, right? And there's probably a good likelihood that any one of you has a skill set that could fit in any one of these companies, even if it might not be for these specific roles. And this is something that we often say at Terra that, um, you know, most, I would say probably 90 to 95% of the people who come through our learning programs already have all the skills they need to work effectively in climate. You know, we just, they just need to build up the literacy to understand how to do that work effectively and how to translate their skills into that work. Um, so again, there's probably roles in all these companies, but again, how do you decide between an energy company, you know, a company that's doing plant, you know, plant-based beverages, a company that's helping people, you know, go you know, like a local meal service, a policy and advocacy organization, how do you compare the impact of these things against each other and, and things like that? So um, what I'm gonna take you through is what we call the Climate Organization Impact Guide. Um, you can find this, you can find this online. Um, I think my colleagues will, will paste the link to it in the chat for you so you can have it. Um, but this, this guide is here to, and as it says, to de demystify the landscape of climate work through a tiered system we can give you insights into sectors, roles, and the ethical dimensions of climate work um, so you can understand that. So I'm going to tell you kind of, I'm going to take you through this report and kind of how we think about it and how we frame it. Um, but also just know that it's also there for you written out. You know, we spent a lot of time on that. And so you've got that resource for you as well. Um, so don't worry if you miss something that I say as we're talking about this or something like that. All that, all that, all that is still going to be there for you. So First, first step, um, how do we think about this? How are we approaching building these tiers for folks to, to navigate? Um, we always say start with emissions. So here's one way to slice emissions, and there are more than there are more than one. You'll actually see another one in a moment. Um, but this is saying, okay, what are the main sectors for green global greenhouse gas emissions? Now, this isn't just carbon dioxide here, this is capturing all greenhouse gas emissions. Um and so energy takes up a huge amount of it. You see 73.2% broken down mainly into industry, transport, and buildings. Um, then equal to those slices in some ways is agriculture, forestry, and land use. Although you see that then broken down even further into livestock and manure, soils, rice, crop burning, deforestation, um, and then waste and another slice of industry that's more about the creation of chemicals or the creation of cement. Um, when you're starting to think about where should I orient to in terms of where's the work that needs to be done, there are, like everything, there are hype waves in climate in different areas that lots of people are talking about or really interested in, gets in the news cycle, things like that. And it's always good to ground in the science of if we need to get emissions to zero or near zero or net zero, um, where do we need to focus to do that? And this is a great starting point as a map to say, okay, most of this work that needs to be done is in energy. 
And again, you can even break it down and they've got iron and steel, food and tobacco, paper and pulp, other industry, road transport, aviation, shipping, residential buildings, commercial buildings. So there's all these different areas, right? And very quickly, you can see that there's a lot of small slices. But if you want to focus on an area, you know, energy use, of course, then agriculture, forest and land use are going to be the two big ones. We talk about sectors and levers, you know, when we when we orient to this as well. And so, again, here's another way to think about what are the main areas for climate solutions. This is by Project Drawdown versus Our World and Data. Again, we see they look at electricity, they separate transport out. So you'll see this, again, this is a bit of a different slicing. We see transport and building separate with electricity. So all those can kind of make up energy. But again, there's different pieces of it. Um, food, agriculture, and land use industry, again, is there. Um, we see a much bigger support for sinks. Here. So this is an area that we'll, we'll talk about a little more around carbon removal, um, <clears throat> but not either natural through shifting practices, protecting and restoring ecosystems. Um, and then you can actually see that the, the actual technical sinks, whether coastal and ocean or engineered, are quite small. And we'll talk about that a little bit more. Um, so again, another way to think about the main sectors to focus on here. This is where this is where most of the work needs to be done. Um, and then we also talk about levers. And what we mean by levers is that um, there's the work that's done, sort of the physical atom moving work of the work in these sectors. And then there's also a bunch of supporting ecosystems around it that allow that atom moving work, that decarbonization work to happen more effectively, right? So that's things like policy that you know helps people adopt electric vehicles or <clears throat> you know creates better public transport systems and things like that. Um, there's finance, which can overlap with policy as well, which is, you know, capital ensuring, helping capital flow into those areas, getting investors more comfortable investing in those spaces and things like that. You know, that also overlaps with things like education as well, you know, helping people just understand these spaces a little bit more and these different types of advocacy that you can do. So, and I'll get into the, the dynamics of that again a little bit later, but so you can both think about like, okay, there's energy, for example, or there's electricity. And within that, there's maybe I want to efficiency as an area I'm interested in. But then there's not only just like installing heat pumps or something like that, but there's also how do we increase financing of heat pumps? How do you create enhance the uptake of heat pumps? Are there policies in place that help people install and bring heat pumps in for builders and things like that? Are those good policies or not? You know, all of these different things, right? So again. I'm going to stretch you out a little bit as we go through this conversation and then we'll come back again. But this is one of our stretch out moments, right? There's a lot here. And, and that's a theme that we're, you're going to see. Um, because what I'm trying, one of the things I'm trying to help you orient around is actually there's not one place per se, right? There's lots of different places where we need lots of different people working on this. Um, three other principles that we, we use to ad address this. One is it's about discernment and variance. And I'll get into that a little bit more when I talk about the different tiers and how we've structured it. But what we're saying is that what we want to do is give you clarity. And to us, clarity means um, the likelihood that a role is going to have positive climate impact. Now, there are roles that might be in a lower tier as we break these down that in which the actual impact could be a lot higher, but the variance of that particular role is quite high, which means let's say... You could be in an organization where the organization is not focused on, let's say, renewable energy, but, you know, let's take it at Google as an example, right? Um, Google is an organization that's been really proactive at promoting this concept of, you know, 24-hour carbon-free electricity, and they're trying to do that with their data centers, right? Super, super high impact of that organization, that role. You could be working at another company that's, you know, has a lot of data centers that couldn't care less about this thing. And you could be in a, you know, sort of sustainability role and your impact could be pretty low, right? So we, we've gotten down to a very specific role here, you know, energy manager um, for, or energy procurement for data centers, right? And, but there's a huge variance based on the organization you're at, right? So we're trying to help you understand, well, what are the different layers of discernment you need to bring on to a specific role? And through that, we mean we're trying to minimize the variance and how we're, we're classifying these different types of roles that we're going to get into. There's no silver bullets. Um, there's not one thing you can do that's going to solve this. And, you know, we talk about this all the time. You know, we need many, many people working in many, many different solutions. So if you come across, if you ever get you in your head, like this role is going to be the one that's going to solve everything, um, you're probably a little bit off. 
Um, and it's good to investigate that and, and question that and investigate why, you know, because there, there isn't one solution. Um, and, you know, we, if you come through our Learning for Action program, we actually take you through interactive models where we help you understand, you know, how to see that and actually like say, hey, okay, I think this solution is really important. Okay, well, let's let's maximize the rollout of this solution. What's the actual impact on temperature globally from that? And then you can kind of see how it worked. Lastly, what we're going to say is remember justice. And what we mean by this is that, um, you know, the us, we're all part of a system that has in some way, shape or form that has taken us to this, this kind of precipice of emissions, extinction, you know, tipping points in different environmental areas. And while we are addressing and driving these solutions, we need to think critically about whether or not and how these solutions are, are being done. And if we're addressing and trying to implement these solutions in the same way that got us to where we are, are, are we really going to end up in the right place or not? You know, and that's a critical thing for, for everyone to think about as they're doing their roles and to think about what does it mean to, to integrate this? And, and I'll give I'll give one personal example from my own life. Um, I worked for a, uh, a large development finance institution. You know, we were we were fun putting eight billion dollars into different climate projects around adaptation, resilience, energy, um, forestry, et cetera. And there was one project we were involved in in Mexico, where a giant wind farm was going to have a big impact on decarbonizing that grid. And nobody thought, you know, they the the project developers thought that they could just lay this interconnection line that went through this area that included an, an indigenous territory and, um, and a couple other local communities. And they could have very easily put a small amount of money into ensuring that those communities got access to this electricity um, in some way, shape or form, or were involved in the project in some way, shape or form. And instead of practicing inclusion, they just sort of said, yeah, we're going to get the permits and we're going to, we'll, you know, we'll just go build this. And this is what we've been doing for a long time. Um, and the project ended up getting delayed for many, many years, um, because this community rallied and fought back and, you know, and didn't slow down this project. And these are people who I think would have really supported the, the values of the, of the wind farm and the project. And I saw like a lot of megawatts not go on the, on the grid, um, because people weren't thinking about, uh, the communities affected by the work being done and how to include those communities in, in this work, as opposed to exclude, um, and yes, it might have cost a little bit more, but in the broad scheme of things, I saw the cost go way, way higher up due to the project delays than what we would have had to invest in, in doing that work. So um, this is this image on the right here is from the California Center for Climate Justice, but just a couple different lenses through which um, to think about it. And again, we're not going to go deep into this, but in any role that you go into, it's worth critically thinking about how can we mainstream justice within the solutions that, that we're, we're, we're providing as well and as we pursue climate solutions. Okay, a lot of qualifications through that process. Now we're getting into the meat of stuff. So what are these five tiers? Why did, and how do we define them? So the first tier that we have here um, is, called, is, our, is our top tier. And this is where we kind of encourage the most people to go and work in. And we, we call this tier necessary and immediate emissions reductions. And so to us, th these are roles at organizations that are exclusively and directly focused on the delivery of demonstrably high impact and essential climate solutions that deliver immediate scalable emissions reductions. Okay, that's a, that's a mouthful. So I'll break down these main parts. So exclusively and directly focused. So we want you working at organizations that are, have, are laser focused on, on climate impact um, and climate solutions. And the reason for this is that, you know, any organization that's focusing on multiple things, it's hard to focus on multiple things. And at some point you hit a trade-off, right? And again, if we're trying to decrease your variance of the likelihood of having impact, we want you to be working on an organization that's got a really clear focus. Um, maybe it's pivoting within the area of areas of climate solutions, but it's got that clear focus. We want them focusing on demonstrably high impact and essential solutions. So again, going back to those first slides I showed you, we want, we want to be focused on solutions that we know are necessary and have a high potential for impact. Um, and I'll talk about some of those right now in a moment. Um, and then we talk about immediate scalable emissions reductions. So these are things that the science tells us work, that we know that if you know, you're working on this stuff right now, we can measurably reduce emissions um, and we can, we can take, you know, we can find ways that overall carbon emissions will go down very quickly based on the implementation of these solutions. 
Um, and they're scalable. We have an under, it's, there's no long-term, you know, tech transfer that needs to happen or rollout or deployment. These are things that can be deployed just about anywhere in the world right now. So main areas of these right now that we're talking about, um, renewable energy and energy efficiency, big area, um, main renewable energy technologies, cost, the cost benefits of energy efficiency as well. Those two things work hand in hand. The more efficient everything is, the, the less energy we need to, to power everything. Um, and all the systems that sort of work in between those two things, right? Your, your grid interactions and things like that. Um, food, agriculture, decarbonization, that, that area, um, also a huge, super important one, touches land use, touches deforestation reduction, um, but really transforming our food systems, right? And again, this goes back to those first two images I showed you from our world and data where you saw energy and you saw food and land use. And then again, those were the two big blocks um, that you saw around, well, electricity, transport, buildings, and then food and agriculture that you saw with the Project Radon graph. The third one that we'll say is a, is a big main area that is, you know, the reduction of other greenhouse gases, especially methane. Uh, methane is a, <clears throat> has a much higher climate impact um, per particle in the atmosphere um, than carbon dioxide. Uh, we always need to be focused on carbon dioxide because if we don't address carbon dioxide, the overall temperature will continue to rise. But there's a lot of fast winds that we can have around methane, reducing methane flares, things like that, um, where we can keep our top, if, if we're on a good trajectory with carbon dioxide, we don't want to spike the temperature up with too much methane going out there. And so addressing methane is, is a really important one as well right now. Um, and, you know, like we said earlier, not just sort of the direct solutions areas of this, but also the financing for these types of solutions, the policy advocacy necessary to accelerate and advance these solutions in all different parts of the world. And then what I would call the tech stack, um, that the tech stack that supports these solutions, right? Different platforms that allow either more money to get into these spaces or different types of solutions to be done, or, you know, there's a whole tech stack around each one of these that, that also um, can help, right? Smart home, tech stacks that allow you to integrate all these different renewable energy technologies that make it easier to manage all of them or, or get more value out of them overall, things like that. So all of these together is sort of how we classify our tier one. And in the actual report, we give um, examples of a lot of different organizations that fall into this and things like that. So if you're saying, okay, great, got the high level, I want to I wanna give, give me examples, I would, the report's got a lot of those in it. Tier two, we call these longer term solutions. So these are roles and roles organizations that are exclusively focused on the delivery of potentially high leverage solutions addressing hard to decarbonize areas necessary to reach net zero emissions, but whose achievable impact is unknown. Okay, I'm going to break all that down again for you too. So same as tier one, we, we, we want to see focus with these organizations. Um, next, we say potentially high leverage solutions. Um, what we mean by this are these are these are solution areas um, where we we know that a solution to them would be really valuable if we kind of continue on the trajectory that we're all on right now. Um, but how important that solution is is kind of dependent on how much we we solve a lot of this stuff and how effective we are doing the tier one work. Um, Addressing hard to decarbonize areas necessary to re reach net zero. So I'll kind of go into some of these things, but. This is, again, going back to our first graph I showed you, steel, cement, um, probably sustainable aviation fuels. Um, so right, these are all kind of things that we know that we need to, if we're, if we're going to decarbonize all of our systems, we're going to have to figure out some solutions to these things. But you saw that first, all those are smaller wedges compared to all the other ones that we saw. Um, and also, uh, we're still very, very early in these solutions areas. If you go into the space right now, you know, the impact is going to be felt in 10 to 20 years. You know, these aren't things that are going to have super big impacts on, on carbon dioxide emissions reduction right now. And, you know, again, just to compare tier two to tier one, if we are to, the more work we do in tier one, the more time we have to figure out the solutions in, in tier two. Um, and then, you know, to necessary to reach net zero emissions. So again, we add carbon capture to this, this area as well. Um, and, and I'll get a little bit more into why that is in a moment um, and why carbon capture is in a separate area. You hear a lot about it, but again, you know, if you think about it, it's like there's a bathtub and there's a drain 
and the 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 faucet is all the carbon emissions. So, you know, unless you want to blow up the bathtub, you know, the bathtubs are earth though, so we don't really want to do that. So, you know, the size of the drain matters, and those are how we remove emissions. But it's a lot more effective to just turn the tap down. Um, and so tier one's a lot of the tap turning down, and some of this as well. Carbon removal is more that drain. I included in this as well the any work at the national labs around this stuff. There's a lot of like deep research being done around different materials um, that all have to do with better ways to deliver low carbon solutions across the board. But again, these are things that are still in national labs. They're not going to be you know activated for quite a long time, but maybe necessary. Okay, tier three, we call tier three impact with an asterisk. Um, why we do that? Well, we say the impact of these worlds highly depends on the individual organizations involved. And the potential, they have the potential to be highly meaningful and impactful. Think back to that example I gave of the, the person at Google versus another data center organization. Well, that hinges on the sincerity of the commitment and the actual work of the organization. So this is, and so there's two types of ways you can think about this. One is sectors and one is roles. So there are certain sectors where this really comes into play. Um, I would say some of the main ones include you know, work at utilities, you know, where you can have some utilities that are incredibly proactive at achieving, you know, renewable energy targets and decarbonization goals. And then you've got utilities um, such as the one in Wisconsin where I'm based uh, who like to really drag their feet on that and aren't being proactive about that. Right. And, you know, not to say that you can't have big impacts on either one of those, you know, you could say, hey, well, what if I got a job at the utility in Wisconsin that's going really slow and, you know, could drive a lot of change? And I would say, yes, possibly, right? But again, now we're talking through the variance and these other dimensions of it, right? And, you know, you want to be informed that if you're going into a role that you understand what you're, what you're facing and what's going to be, what you're, what's coming up in front of you. And so there's a higher variance here. Um, I would say, we also say that nature-based solutions fall into this space. Um, there's some really amazing nature-based solutions projects out there. And there's also a lot of projects around nature-based solutions and carbon credits that um, aren't real or have tons of problems around additionality, permanence, leakage, and things like that. So you got to really do your research to, to, to go into a role around there. And we want to be really thoughtful about that. Um, and we would also say carbon, any carbon management, right? Because you're providing carbon management services, possibly strategy advisory, but, you know, the organ, and yes, you know, there's the adage that people can only manage what they can measure. So it's good to do that measurement. But again, if you're not actually delivering the solutions that those organizations need to implement, um, and you don't know what, how much those organizations are actually going to implement those things over what time scale, what their commitment and sincerity level is. You're doing some work for it or some consultancy work, but there's there's more out there, right? So those are those are some like big sector areas that we often see people go and work in that we classify this in. Um, and then roles. And there's sort of five main roles that we kind of talk about. Um, we would say uh, roles that are focused on tier one or tier two solutions, but they're not the core business. So an example of this would be like the head of the um, regenerative agriculture division at Monsanto, right? People would have probably have very different, if I surveyed people on this call um, or on the live stream, I would probably hear a lot of different opinions as to whether or not that's a, a good job to take, both because of people's opinions on Monsanto. You know, some people might say, a lot of resources. If I can convince Monsanto that this is a super valuable thing and get resources dedicated to it, you know, they've got tons of contact with farmers and things like that. It can have a really big impact. Um, other people might say they're a bad actor. No way that the, that you're going to have big impact. If more than that, you might just be greenwashing a lot of the bad stuff that they're doing and they're going to hype your what you're doing, but they're only going to be giving you a really small budget, right? There's, a, again, big variance there, right? And that's always the thing to remember. Um, the next one would be sustainability roles and non-sustainability companies, right? Being a chief sustainability officer at, um, you know, let's say an Apple or something like that, right? Where, yes, there's again, a lot of impact that you can have, but there are chief sustainability officers who have no resources and no teams. And, you know, the company touts that they have a chief sustainability officer and they're just like, 
kind of trying to get people to recycle. And there's chief sustainability officers that have like CEO support and they're doing all kinds of awesome stuff and they've got teams and they got resources and they're having a lot of impact, right? High variance. Climate kind of consulting we put in here because again, you can do a lot of consulting work. I don't know if there are other consultants on this call, but sometimes you do a bunch of consulting work and nothing happens. And sometimes you do a bunch of consulting work and lots of things are implemented and it's really amazing. And again, high variance. Um, government, kind of similar to non-sustainability companies, you know, governments have a lot of other mandates. And so different governments can have, you know, you know different governments can have different um, incentives or drives to, you know, support decarbonization or other sustainability efforts within the, the populations that they serve. Um, and the last one I would say is materials efficiency. So uh, an example of a materials efficiency role would be like, you know, what if you're trying to, you know, minimize the carbon footprint of packaging at Amazon, right? Yeah, you're maybe overall making every Amazon package um, lower carbon, which is good, but ultimately, are you really driving, you know, decarbonization or not? Again, there's different debates as to what that is. And, and again, you start to see higher variance in that. Um, so this is a big area, right? And and the why the the thing I want you to take away from thinking about this tier three isn't to say that there are bad roles here, or even to say that any of the roles are actually bad roles. Um, it's again about thinking back to the principles we shared, there's high variance and also it requires you to have a lot of discernment about what's the type of role I'm actually getting into. Is this an empowered role where I can hit the ground running and, you know, yeah, I'm going to have to still advocate for climate action and solutions and things like that, but I've got the resources and the support and the team, or, you know, am I, is this an organization that's hiring me to do this? But when, when the rubber really hits the road, um, you know, there's, there's not a lot of support or they're not really willing to invest beyond the money that they've allocated for my role and things like that. Right. And so I'm not going to go through it here, but in the report, um, we give you some good questions to ask if you're applying to roles in either these sectors or these types of roles um, to help you discern and some just exercises you can do to help you get a better understanding of what, what you might be getting into and how to talk to those organizations and get the right information around those things. Not in a way that's maybe confrontational, but just so that you can have the right information that you know what that opportunity really is um, and what you're getting into. Again, now that you should say no but just, to, just so you know how to approach it. And here's a couple of examples of those questions. Um, you know, how committed is an organization to decarbonization? Is there evidence to support that? Um, you know, things like commitments, public commitments, lobbying dollars being spent. You would be surprised to find some organizations with really great public commitments. And then when you actually understand how they're lobbying, um, it might not be exactly the same. Um, for consulting or greenhouse gas management, can you provide examples of how clients have had tangible climate impact through the company, through the organization's work? Um, and nature-based solutions and common mon carbon monitoring. Um, you know, has anyone been to any of the projects on the ground and been around them for a meaningful period of time? And how do you address some of these key issues around additionality, leakage, permanence? Um, and if you're raising your head, head thinking, wait, what's additionality? What's leakage? What's permanence? What's he talking about? Um, totally understand. Super important things to know, though, if you're going into these spaces. Um, and I would simply say, we've got, Terry, we've got a couple of programs that can really help you understand these things pretty uh, a lot faster. We've got a carbon removal program led by uh, a great guy named Sylvan. And we have our Learning for Action program. And both of those programs will, will help you get up to speed on, on understanding these things. Um, so just had that little aside. And I also just want to talk for a moment about this idea of like, why does this literacy matter, right? So we, we are a climate education organization. We advocate for everyone who's going in to do this work to really make sure that you know what you're talking about when you go into these organizations. Um, that's both so that you do the work effectively, but that literacy also sometimes helps you get the job too. Um, and so I just had this one quote from a former fellow within the Learning for Action program who got uh, a job working in climate. And I'm not going to read the whole thing, but uh, she said, articulating the risks of hitching the company's success to metrics around carbon markets, greenwashing, so carbon work, um, and hearing the CEO's vision of the actual work to be done helped me establish trust quickly, evaluate whether this place was a place with the real mitigation and agricultural benefit. 
Um, I had a background that also played a part, but that candid talk and that knowledge really helped me out. And so I would say, um, even asking these questions that we're talking about at this tier will probably, based on the responses you get and the way you get those responses, help you know if it's a great place or not. And by the way, that might help you stand out as a candidate as well. Um, so just an, uh, one of the reasons why we really advocate for literacy as you transition into working on climate, whether that's before you get a job or even after. I mean, a lot of people who go through our programs after they've gotten jobs in climate want to just make sure they're really up to speed to do the work effectively. I see something in the q and I'm going to finish with these tiers and then I'll, I'll look at the question. Tier four, we call these silver bullets. Um, at the end of the day, climate change is a physical world problem. Um, there's work that we can do on our computers to help certain climate solutions move faster. Uh, you know, Terror.do is an education company. We have an education platform. There's an advocacy element of that. Um, but ultimately, you know, we need to be you know, the, the coal and other fossil fuels need to not be going into power plants and other forms of energy and other types of solutions need to be built. And, you know, the work in energy and the work in buildings and the work on um, in industry and transportation and, and land use. I mean, these are physical, these are physical things. So it'd be very weary of something that's like click buttons, climate solved. Um, and then, like I said earlier, there's no silver bullet for, for addressing climate change as well. So it's um, anytime you're starting to feel like, if only we, when we solve this, everything is going to be better. You really bring on the, the step up the discernment levels. Um, some examples of where this comes up. Um, a lot of the offsets world um, is this. Uh, it's a trying to evolve and doing its best, but... The, the research kind of continues to suggest that it's it's not great. Yes, it's a, possibly a, a good way to redistribute finance, but it tends to stand in to, you know, emerging markets and things like that for forest preservation. And that's fine. But the evidence says that the impact's pretty low and minimal, and it can be distracting companies from doing the work they need to do to decarbonize their own internal work. So we put that in here. Um, Web 3.0, these two things tend to be pretty married. Um, and there's a kind of climate 3.0 world. And we've, we've had some graduates from our programs go and work in this, but we haven't seen any major evidence to say that this is, this is there's any major meaningful impact happening here. Um, ESG investing. Um, so yes, there are like ESG roles that are in tier three that kind of cover these things, but ESG investing from a finance standpoint, um, we've generally seen it be more a co-opted reason to, charge higher fees. Now, there's some subsets of this. If you're doing really focused economic investing in specific areas and things like that, um, you know, putting money into a portfolio of renewable energy projects or things like that, sure. Um, but in general, we, we say be weary of the ESG finance space um, and roles in that space. We, we haven't seen much impact in, in many places. Not that there's not a lot of impact you can have with your personal finances and things like that, but in that sector... Um, bioenergy, there's just some land use limitations, small scale in certain geographies make sense, but at, at any sort of meaningful scale, we, we don't see any evidence that supports that as a really major solution. Um, and lastly, uh, nuclear fusion, um, it's kind of a, a sort of general story that it's always, I think the last paper I read said it's 16.3 years away. I wrote a paper that said it was 16 years away, I think 20 years ago. Um, so you know, it's, it's, that's where it's at. And not to say that I don't think that possibly some nuclear solutions might be part of the energy mix 50 years from now, but we don't want to wait for that. And I wouldn't encourage people to prioritize their time. I know some people have a very focused skill set and it makes sense to go there. Right. But I don't think it's the right place for people to be prioritizing their solutions time. Um, and, and we don't as an organization. And then tier five, um, we haven't seen a lot of evidence that oil and gas companies are, are that serious about this stuff. And we tend to facilitate a lot of people leaving the oil and gas industry to come, to come work at other companies. Um, talent drain has a really big impact on organizational decision-making and things like that and responsiveness. And so, um, you know, from a advocacy standpoint and from an impact standpoint, our general um, perspective is that if you have the ability to do climate work in a certain uh, nation, 
that doesn't require you to work at a oil and gas company. Um, it's your best taking your talents elsewhere. Um, and you know, for a number of reasons, I say that with the little asterisks, which is that in some countries, the only places where there are, you know, major energy footprint portfolios for renewable energy and things like that are oil and gas companies. Um, and this tends to be common in a lot of the global South. And so there, there is an asterisk to that. Um, and so that doesn't mean that we still encourage that, but we've, we've seen people go and, and do that work. And again, it's going to require the same discernment and things like that, but we, you know, we don't want to say no, 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 but especially if you're in the global North, we would say um, it's probably in the highest interest to be someone who doesn't go and work at those companies because you know, your talents, um, you know, it's where you spend your time. Now, we didn't talk about adaptation at all. And, you know, adaptation usually gets the short end of the stick when you're talking about climate, because ultimately, you know, in adaptation, we're continuing to adapt to the climate changing. So if we don't change the climate, we're, you know, if we don't do the work we need to do to reduce emissions, we're just going to see, we have to do more and more adaptation work. And, you know, we already have about over 1.5 degrees Celsius, pretty baked in at this point. Um, and so there is going to need to be uh, adaptation work that's done. Now, there is some overlap between adaptation and mitigation because adaptation also touches things like food systems, water conservation, communities, energy systems, um, some uh, organic carbon removal uh, and, and policy and things like that. So there are some overlaps to ad adaptation and mitigation. Um, the other thing to, to think about around adaptation, especially when you're looking for roles and things like that, and we, we took this quote from IPCC AR6, and I think this is pretty accurate, which is to say that most observed adaptation is fragmented, small in scale, incremental, sector specific, designed to respond to current impacts or near-term risks, and focused more on planning rather than implementation, which is to say there are these roles out there, but they're buried in a lot of very diverse types of organizations, and it's going to be a lot of work for you to find them. Um, we need people doing this work. We need people understanding this work. Um, and, you know, there are a few organizations that are starting to do more resilient to adaptation work, especially like large scale infrastructure organizations and things like that, and governments, of course, and, and disaster response organizations. Um, but it's it's sort of in these small areas, parametric flood insurance being an, being another area that where we see adaptation kind of coming into play. Um, so important, absolutely. Um, but again, sort of is how much adaptation we need to do is somewhat dependent on how effective we are at the mitigation work that we do too. So you got to think about those two things hand in hand. Um, okay, I talked through these tiers. I want to put them back on a graph graphic so you can kind of see them in place, right? Um, so this is another uh, graphic made by Project Drawdown. Um, it's talking about the greenhouse gas emissions um, that pathway that we sort of need to follow and that red dot is sort of where we are now, um, but also wants us to think about, you know, what are the total greenhouse gas emissions that we're trying to reduce in the next 30, 25 to 30 years, um, and what's the removal work we need to do. And I think this helps you visualize, like, why do we have these tiers in, in the way they are? So all those necessary immediate scalable reductions, tier one that we were talking about, that's that big chunk at the top there that we that we can take out, right? And if we're able to, to turn the curve fast, um, it buys us a lot more time to address some of those harder to decarbonize areas, um, which is that tier two you see down at the bottom there, especially that last little window and probably some of the middle group. Um, and also to allow the carbon removal that we may we will need to also get up to scale, um, though scale is still quite small. So you see those tier two ones and just you can kind of see tier two versus tier one, just in, in the total size of that blue space is why we have those as in the order that we do. Um, tier three, you sort of captures that variance to say a lot of tier three work is gonna help address that blue, those blue spaces there, um, but it might also not, and might also help us go into the black up above, right? And that's that high variance element that I talked about before. And then tier four and five, we have up in the black, you know, if we just keep taking off with the missions. Um, I think if everyone were to go and work in those spaces, that's what we would see happen. Right? And that's why we have them there. So um, just sort of grounding us back in a, in a graph to help us think about that. Um, 
I think before I go any further, I just want to see, I know there was one thing in the Q and A and I want to see if it's relevant. Um, that's, that's from quite a few slides back. Yeah. Um, you mentioned the roles that potentially high impact companies such as Apple and Google, though you distinguish that the actual impact uh, one is likely to have in roles like that will have high variance. What kind of resources do you trust most when it comes to parsing out? Yeah. So you're going to have to, you know, I think there's lots of different ways, you know, talking to people is always the best way. You know, we often have fellows of our learning for action program go into some of these roles and it's always interesting to talk with them and say, okay, now that you're at this organization, like how real is the impact? You know, what would I need to, you know, what's actually happening on the ground? Some people will share, some people might not. Um, you know, there's third party reports out there uh, that are, are useful to look at that, you know, assess, um, you know, Climate Action 100, for example, um, is a great uh, annual report that looks at some of the larger organizations and assesses, you know, what are they doing in terms of setting pledges and acting on their pledges? Um, Science-based target initiative is another great one to look at. Um, and then there's a lot of sort of NGOs that do assessments of utilities and other organizations like that um, to, to get a sense of, uh, you know, which ones are our leaders, which ones are sort of twiddling their thumbs and which ones are laggards or even resistors. Um, and so I, those are some spaces. We, we give some examples of, of some resources there, um, but just wanted to, to touch on that quickly. Um, we did some research recently on people who've come through our program just because, you know, we, we did this and then we, we, we were doing a, a parallel research project. Um, I also just wanted to go back to our original couple companies and say what falls into what there. Um, and so we've got the Khalifa, Purple Care, and Origis or Energies, where all tier one solutions, um, and Cadmus and Recology fall into this tier three. Um, and actually the uh, the one that's not on here is that internship in, in Paris. And that one would actually be in the in the tier one area as well. That's that's focused on buildings, tier one, tier two, because buildings and construction. Um, and the more it's kind of building the energy efficiency, I think that would put it towards tier one. And if the more of it's around sort of construction and materials, it might move it towards tier two. Um, and if it's GHG management, right, then you think it kind of moves towards tier three, right? And these are this is how you gotta look at a role and really get a sense of like what's the actual work being done here, you know, because some organizations might cross a couple of these as well. And you gotta understand that. Um, but anyways, we looked at we looked at all the graduates. Um, we've got about uh in the, so we looked from 2020 to 20, the end of 2023, and there's about a thousand Teradot do graduates, a little more than a thousand currently working in climate full-time right now. And so we looked at what, where do they fall into these different types of roles and what's their breakdown? Um, and, you know, in some ways we found that this kind of reflects uh, this previous graph a little bit. We're seeing the majority of them, 50% going into 50, 51% going into these tier one roles a small slice in those tier two roles, um, a, a good chunk, 20, almost 20% in these tier three roles, again, right, high variance, um, but a, a place where you can have a lot of impact. Um, and then a sort of breakdown of this last 25% into what I would call nature stewardship, which you can kind of translate into, into adaptation with a little bit of um, you know, deforestation pre prevention and things like that into it. Um, and then this remaining varied tended to be people in roles where they were doing work across multiple tiers. So let's say you're an investor and you're not specifically investing in only tier one solutions, but across a group of them, or you're a freelancer working with multiple different companies, maybe like doing program management or product management or, or you know, business strategy or operation, fractional operations officers, finance, things like that for companies. And you're working for companies across the tier one, tier two, tier three nature stewardship group. So that, that's that last breakdown slice. Um, so just wanted to give a little bit of a slice of that. Okay, we got 10 minutes left. Some, some key takeaways for you all. I know, I know I've given you a lot of information here. Um, I'm hoping that you know, you've got the, you've got the um, report still for you to, to look at that will hopefully help you out. Um, how, how should you digest all of this and you know, crystallize it into your own kind of personal climate career arc that you're on? Um, I'd say one, there's a lot of nuance to all these things, you know, don't let perfect be the enemy of the good. You know, some people really want to have this one role with this one function and have it be the highest impact possible in the highest impact area. And what we always tend to say to people is that um, there's, you know, we need so many, uh, it takes many seeds to plant a garden, right? And we need so many people working on so many different parts of the solution space that as a first step, 
the role that you find is, is, is a good first step, you know, and maybe you're not going to have as much impact as you wanted, but, um, even just getting started is, is a great thing to do. And that kind of brings us into this point too, which is that a climate career can have, have many steps, right? Landing in that perfect job might not happen right away. What that perfect job is for you will evolve. And what that perfect job is for you is very different from what that perfect job is for someone else. And, you know, you as a person also evolve too. And we always say, you know, just get working. Like you get the most experience if you just get into it and get going. So use all this information to help you make decisions between things, but you know, action is better than inaction. So when, when, you know, all the cards are on the table um, and if there's, you know, Hey, I understand that this might job and role might have some limitations, but I want to get going and just see how much impact I can have in this role. We would say, yeah, of course, go for that. And part of that is because every job will have some traps. And this goes back to what we were saying about justice, right? Um, there are, there's many ways that tier one organizations and work can evolve too, and, and they can do better work around, around especially justice. Um, but they're all organizations navigating their own growth and development within a, you know, within the current, you know, fossil fuel driven economy. And so you're going to find friction and challenges in every single role that you come into. So there's no, there's, you're not going to get away from that in some way, shape or form. So that discernment even needs to exist in the tier one roles. Um, and finally, you know, we, we really try to, 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 to help people. I was going to say drill this home, but I realized that I'm trying to get fossil fuel terms out of my head. Well, would geothermal drill this home maybe is a better way to say it, um, which is that, you know, every role requires advocacy, you know, regardless of where you are, if you're in a climate company, you're, in, you're often needing to be an advocate to potential customers who are going to be possibly, you know, taking on your solutions. If you're in a tier two or tier three organization, you might be needing to advocate for, you know, why should there be some resources for this solution or, you know, to other people within your organization and some of those tier three organizations. And so, you know, it's, it's part of the, the challenge of climate work in this day and age is that we're going to have to be an advocate pretty consistently, regardless of where you land. It just kind of depends on to whom you're being that advocate. Um, so building those communication skills, building the capacity to talk about climate impacts, climate science and climate solutions um, is really valuable in, in any role because you, because you want to be a good advocate and you want to advocate in a way that feels um, clear and easy and, and healthy for you too. And we talk about this a lot in our learning for action program around like having emotional resilience and being able to sustain doing this work, right? You know, I may have just thrown that graph up and been like most recent reason why I'm concerned but there's an emotional process I go through the first time I see a graph like that and, and you know, and, and what that really means and, you know, my own connection to the ocean and our planet and things like that. And so community really helps that. That's why, you know, we learn in community, we solve problems in community. It's good to have healthy community. Um, sometimes that community can be your organization. Sometimes you need it to be a community because you're just kind of more on your own within an organization doing work. Um, so, and if you're looking for those types of communities, again, uh, our learning for action program is a great place for you to, to do that. Um, I'm just going to turn slightly as I see our evening sun is coming into my room. Um, uh, a couple of just data points on, on folks who come through our program um, that we have. I'm just going to talk about this really quickly. Uh, we see, we did, we got to do a bunch of research on everyone who's come through our program in the first three and a half years of the program. And we found about, we had about 1,100 graduates who are now actively working on climate solutions, um, who a majority of whom have transitioned into roles, but there's also a good number who take the program, um, are, are having already gotten into a climate role and wanting to upskill and be more effective in it. Um, we've seen that about a fifth of folks transition within three months of graduating from the program, although that number grows all the way to three to 75% plus. And of our older cohorts, we see over three quarters of, of folks. And I think the, the highest is up to like 96% of one of the cohorts um, tra transition towards a working climate. So if you're committed to this, you, you know, you do the learning, you do, you know, you build, you do the work, it grows. And a lot of that is, you know, we're not a master's program where people come into our program and, you know, pause their lives to, to do that, right? So this is, people take the program while they're working. And so people's job search trajectories are very different based on what they're, you know, if they're, unemployed and they're really focused on the job search and doing all this stuff really quickly. If they're, you know, taking different steps along the way and how quickly they're doing the job searches and things like that. Um, so we, we really see this final, this final number as one that captures like 
everybody's different climate journeys and transitions. Some people get a job in a different organization and a year later, take those skills and pivot. And we see equal success in transitions when people go through a program in the global north and the global south and amongst men and women, which is really awesome to see. So um, sort of effectiveness in, in transitions equally across um, a number of, of factors uh, around diversity. And there's, there's more to that, but those are some of the headlines. Um, I think I'm going to skip this, but this this is this just gives some examples of why do some transitions take time. Uh, I spoke to some of those things. Um, some examples of this that people do um, going to a different role to get a set of experience background and then adding that to to a climate role. Um, this woman who worked at an accelerator uh, was it was her journey um, doing some pro bono work and then getting paid fractional work around a skill set. This is for a more senior person. Um, that was effective for them. Um, somebody taking uh, it, this next person um, took an internship and that internship became, uh, sorry, a freelancing project and then they became a sustainability consultant. So there were those steps they took again. Um, and then some folks, you know, are looking for a job and then as they're looking for a job, they find some solution that's not there. And they actually say, wait, I'm just going to found a company to address this solution. Um, and we see that quite a lot as well. So, uh, or some part of the solution landscape that they see is incomplete. That's what they're interested in. They can't really find a good fit for it. And then they go and build it. Um, and again, just to loop back to what I said before, there really is a role for everyone. You know, we see it in those transition rate data. Um, we see it, you know, in these like specific examples we get from a lot of folks that come through our programs, um, where people come in struggling to find positions and show the fit between their backgrounds and positions or not thinking that they have much to offer in climate because of their skill set. And we consistently see that becoming a barrier that goes away as folks really understand the landscape of, of different solutions out there, all the work that needs to be done and how to take their skill set that they currently have, understand how to talk about the solutions and translate those two things together to, to work. Um, and, and these are two examples of that. Um, so uh, in the last minute or two, and then I'll stay for a moment and, and address some of the chat questions in the Q&A, um, I just want to extend a welcome for those of you as you're thinking about this journey um, to into our Learning for Action program. Our next cohort starts on May 28th. Um, we have, uh, we run cohorts every six weeks um, and uh, it's, uh, we've seen it be a very, very successful, especially in terms of cost for outcomes. Um, way for folks to accelerate their transition towards working on climate, um, either professionally or personally or in their communities. Um, and so we just want to invite you in. We've got a couple open houses coming up next week, May 14th and May 15th. There's a QR code there um, for that. And you can learn more on our company website as well. So just wanted to, to speak to that for a moment. Um, and then, yeah, I want to take a moment to address a couple of the questions that we see here. So there's a question from LinkedIn. Um, are we collaborating with natural history museums to raise awareness about the role of climate change habits? We're not. Um, if you know a natural history museum that wants to collaborate with us though, please introduce us. Um, I think that could be interesting. Um, let's see here. Uh, let's see. Okay, I'm just gonna answer that one first. And I wanna go into the Q and A here. Um, for those in the program now is a list of resources. You mentioned this presentation, um, Ida. Yeah, you can, you have it in your careers resources within your learning management system. If you scroll all the way to the bottom, you can see uh, all the different careers resources and this this report, there's a link to that in there as much as, as well as a lot more uh, data. And then I think that we had the this put in the chat as well, but um, if not, you know, Kristen, we can also just share the, the report with folks after, uh, after everyone who's joined this and we'll send out a link that includes that. Um, okay, yeah, it seems like folks haven't gotten it. So I will throw it into the chat right now and then we'll make sure that we also get it in the LinkedIn um, in the LinkedIn live for folks as well. Um, okay, I'm throwing it in the meeting group chat. Um, Ian or Kristen, hopefully one of you can can repost it. Um, yeah, no problem, of course. Um, 
I see a lot of other, I don't know if this is Kristen, if this is one big LinkedIn question or a bunch of other questions from it. Um, so I'm happy to talk about some of these if they're relevant. Um, these seem to be broader climate questions in general. Um, is the human-induced acceleration of the ongoing sixth mass extinction of non-human animals a major concern in your strategic planning? <laughs> I mean, yeah, I don't know. I mean, that's kind of why we're doing what we're doing. Um, you know, extinction usually, you know, in in my master's degree, we, we talked a lot about um, sort of like uh, canary species, you know, species like species die off is a really great, you know, a lot of species are a lot more sensitive to climate changes than humans are, though we are, we just don't see it in the same way. We don't just die off really quickly um, the way that some of these do. And so paying attention to that's really important. And I think it's uh, one of the big concerning factors that we see. Um, do you consider making polluters pay a good way forward as suggested by someone who lectured at the Mex Bell School policy. Um, so this is a good question and I'll just speak to it on a high level. You know, from a Terra perspective, we're focused on solving the problem and solving the problem is putting is putting energy towards seeding the good things that we need to do. And we're really focused on helping people focus on doing that specific thing. Um, is making polluters pay a good way forward? More capital from polluters, you know, whether that's through carbon taxes or other things like that to accelerate and, and finance this transition is a super valuable solution and definitely part of it. Um, and it is a way forward. Um, I've also been involved in dialogue and conversations and heard conversations about this for 20 years. And it's not where I've seen the most effective acceleration of solutions. You know, like we are humans, humans come together to solve things. Um, we're best when we're all moving towards something positive and moving towards positive change. And there's a role to play in, you know, addressing the people who are doing bad things as well. Um, and so, you know, at Terra, we focus a lot more on, you know, accelerating solutions and getting talent into working on those solutions. Um, though, uh, you know, addressing the people who are who are sort of holding us back is, is obviously a necessary and you know, thing to do as well. Um, what incentives do you consider impactful in reducing air, land, and water pollution? That's way too big a question for this back and forth because um, the answer is there's tons of different incentives, but they all have different, you know, every incentive has some, some challenge with it as well. Um, so I don't think I'm going to address that one right away. Is channeling public funds to fossil fuel companies to do good things for the environment unfair? <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, mainly because, I mean, fair or not fair, I'm not going to talk about fairness, but um, I don't think it's effective. And so if you're trying to do good things for the environment, um, you know, those organizations have plenty of capital and I don't think they need more. Um, they can allocate it just fine that they have, and they've got large balance sheets and everything like that. So uh, I don't think it makes a lot of sense for public funds to be going in that direction at all. Um, so yeah, I'm happy to answer that question. Um, all right. Well, we are at 604. We try to pride ourselves at Terra as well as a, a group of folks who finish most of our sessions on time. So uh, if there aren't any other questions from folks up Let's see here, there might be one or two other things in the Q&A. No, okay. Um, so without any other questions or anything like that, I just wanna say thank you all for being here. Those of you who joined the call, those of you watching on the live session, um, you know, we we really need all of you to to do this work effectively. Um, we, need, and we need a lot more, you know, that's part of Tara's mission. And the last thing I'll, I'll just add in, in our closing moments is that, uh, it's really special to have you all here. You know, it's a it's a very special moment on this planet, I think, to get to be uh, a person alive right now who is able to recognize what what's happening on a global scale to our planet and being able to uh, make a choice in your life to, to do something about it. You know, I think that's a, a very meaningful thing and it's not something to be taken that we that we take lightly. Um, both that Tara has a responsibility for guiding you into, into these roles and into this work um, and to do it effectively and to support you to sustain doing it as well, you know, because we're, we're on a planet that's shaking a lot right now. And it's easy to get distracted by a lot of those things when, you know, underlying it, you know, is a big climactic shift that's happening too. Um, not to say that people, there weren't groups of people that knew that this stuff was going on a lot sooner than, you know, this kind of current 20 year window or something. But I think for, 
a big slice, you know, where it's not just the few people raising their hand or, you know, folks in indigenous communities saying, hey, you know, it's already post-apocalyptic based on how we see the world. Um, but now, you know, we've got through the sort of world of data and science and, and this type of science um, around observations and measurements and using technologies and things like that, you know, we have a really clear understanding that, you know, we need to do something. And it's, and it's a really, I think, valuable thing in, in this lifetime that we're all here on this planet to, to make the choice to do something about that. Um, so feel all very, very welcome. We're happy to have you all here. And, uh, and you know, if you're thinking about joining us in one of our programs, I welcome you in. Um, I think you're going to get more than, than you expect. That's what we tend to see. Um, and if, you know, this is just a stop along your journey, uh, wishing you all the best. So uh, thank you so much. And uh, we will hopefully be seeing you later. <laughs>